Hey, family. It's that time again. It's Friday, and I don't know about you, but this week, oh, this week was, uh, it was a week. It was a week. But today, today, I am super excited because one of the reasons that I created this community was I really wanted to offer support, resources, and hope to people to parents, to family members, to adult children who are trying to help their adult parents function. And they're like, this is so challenging. This is hard. And I just have felt so privileged through my own training, through my own experience, to be able to provide hope for people suffering from OCD and OCD-related disorders. And I got to tell you, I'm pretty excited about today because I think hope is going to expand a bit more. And again, I love that. I want that. So, hey, let's do this. I'm Nicole Morris, licensed marriage and family therapist and mental health correspondent. And let me be the first to say, welcome to the family, the OCD family, that is. I am here to create a community of support for family members, spouses, partners, parents, adult children, as there may be adult words, and chosen family of OCD sufferers and their community. I've had over 22 years of experience in the mental health field, but please note that this information does not qualify or substitute as a diagnostic evaluation, therapy, or treatment, and it is presented on an as-is basis. Please follow up with a qualified mental health provider in your area regarding concerns for yourself or loved ones. Thank you for joining us today. Now, let's get started. You know, it's interesting because when I was in graduate school, we learned a lot of different theories, a lot of different theoretical models. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist, so we had a lot of family therapy models. We had a lot of interpersonal group, dyads, you name it. We like to look at relationship, us MFTers. <laughs> and not to say other clinicians or counselors don't, but that was a really strong focus. I took my licensing exam ages ago in the state of California. Multiple exams. I was really lucky, actually, because they had just moved from three to two exams. So I heard the oral exam that predated my time of licensure was brutal at best. But, you know, the only time where we really had to go, if I was using a family systems therapy intervention and localized just that intervention from just that model, it would look like this. And the reason why is because we have all these different theoretical models, and a lot of them can overlap in some nuanced ways, and some are very similar and some are very different. But the reality is we use these skills all in tandem. And when we start looking at evidence-based practices, there is absolutely a need for the fidelity of the models that we're studying and saying this thing could work, okay? We need to stick to that model, meaning we need to stick to the conditions and the variables that are controlled for to help lead to this consistent, reliable, valid change. So we're not just paying lip service to, I think this could work and I'm going to try it. And it's working. So says I. Worked for this one person I tried it on. So the research tells us we need to be able to do the same things so that we can get those results, right? This can lead to some positive change. This can lead to clinically significant differences in the outcomes of our treatment. And so that's important. That's certainly important. At the same time, though, and this is where it gets kind of tricky and interesting, especially when it comes to OCD, is we've had one really, really, really well studied model that has been the gold standard for treatment in OCD. And you've heard me talk about it a lot if you've been around our family gatherings for a while now, and that's exposure and response prevention. And I am a big believer in exposure and response prevention. This conversation does not change my feelings about that. But there are some really good points that we've talked about throughout 
the podcast as well. The outcomes are great for ERP. And I'm very, very happy about the outcomes that we have, but they don't help everyone. And that makes sense because, you know, if if we could just make it better, we could cure it. We could just obliterate the problem of OCD. It wouldn't exist anymore if it just worked, period. But the ERP isn't an inoculation that is just going to make something disappear. And it's work. We have been very clear from the beginning, hopefully. And if not, let me just, let me just say again, it's hard work. ERP is hard work. And what we're going to talk about today is it's not the only work. It's good work, but it's not the only work. And it's evidence-based work, but it's not the only evidence-based work. And so today I invite you to learn along with me and family. I, I am going to be completely honest with you. This ICBT, this inferential cognitive behavioral therapy, it is hard for me to wrap my mind around. But when I can really kind of dig into it and, and understand it, I really think it's worth presenting to all of you because we should know that there is more than one evidence-based practice that can help treat OCD. And I will tell you, these, these two models, they are radically different in some ways, if you ask me. Very, very different. But that doesn't mean either one is bad. Both have their advantages. And just like people are different, some people are going to like vanilla, some people are going to like chocolate, some people might click with ERP, some people might click with ICBT. But isn't it great to know that we have some options? ICBT, which has been more popular outside of the United States previously, has been around for a good couple of decades as well. And within the practitioner world, there is an emerging competency of using ICBT for the treatment of OCD. But it certainly is not coined as the gold standard. And as I will talk today with my guest, Mike Hetty, I don't even think the goal is for you or I or him or any of us to say what's gold and what's not. But what I can say is if there's an opportunity for some more hope, I am here for it. And so if you're ready to hear about more hope too, you came to the right place. And, and, and I have to say, the conversation that we're going to have today, it reminds me a lot of philosophy class. Don't let that scare you. I don't want to scare anybody off. But if you start listening to this and you go, what are the words coming out of their mouths? <laughs> like, what? What? You're not alone. And hopefully you'll hear from me along the way that I am constantly trying, trying is the operative word, to understand and get it and think about it. You know, when my kids, when I want to know if they understood a concept or if they were listening to me, it's usually more about them listening. And I'm sure parents here can relate. I'll say, tell me what I just said in your own words, right? <laughs> Have you guys ever tried that? Because even if they maybe listen or half listen, usually that kind of shows whether or not they were actually listening to you. But I do a similar process for myself. I often hear what I hear and I try to translate it in my own words of understanding, okay, is this what we're saying? Is this what this means? And so you'll hear me doing that, doing my thing constantly as I do. And you'll hear me sometimes get close and sometimes not. And sometimes even get an A plus, <laughs> which makes me feel really good. I, I love A pluses. Who doesn't love a good A plus? But I just want to say, like, stick with it. If you're like, huh, this is like feeling over my head, please give it a chance. Stick with it. You're not alone. You'll hear me kind of meh, kind of try to figure it out and not always, not always hit the target on that. But I think it's important for us to have this conversation. And I really want you to be a part of it because I want you to know what's available out there. And ERP is available. And this is not a slight against ERP. I love ERP, but it's another option. 
And I love more options too. So most therapy, most any other kind of therapy you go into, there are at least multiple ways to try and address the problem, right? And so if there's another way to help fight OCD out there that is researched and has evidence that shows it works, I want to know about it. And I want you to know about it because I want your loved ones suffering with OCD to know. Maybe you'll learn it today and you'll go, no, ERP is still for me. Great. Maybe you'll learn today and you'll go, no, ICBT, that's for me. Great. Maybe you'll walk away confused and go, okay, I have questions. <laughs> and I do. I, I have questions. <laughs> Great. Let's ask those questions because you're worth it and I'm worth it and our loved ones are worth it. So with that, let's get started because Mike is going to take us on a journey and I am so excited to share it with you. Well, thank you for joining us. We are back with the OCD Family Podcast, and today we are talking about inference-based CBT. That's inference-based cognitive behavioral therapy, and we are very fortunate to have Mike Hetty, LCPC. Mike is the co-owner and co-director of the Anxiety and Stress Disorders Institute. For over a decade, he has specialized in the treatment of OCD, anxiety disorders, and related conditions. As a former adjunct professor, you've been a little busy, Mike. Mike also enjoys teaching, which he has done a lot on ICBT to help really our field of practitioners understand it better. He is a faculty member for the International OCD Foundation's Training Institute, where he runs clinical consultation groups and has produced training webinars on topics related to OCD, such as intimacy and relationships and shame. Mike has also produced trainings for ADAA, which is the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, and numerous group practices across the country and frequently presents at the annual conferences for IOCDF and ADAA. He utilizes cognitive behavioral therapy, exposure and response prevention, ACT, which is acceptance and commitment therapy, and ding, 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 ICBT which is inference-based cognitive behavioral therapy for the treatment of OCD. So thank you so much, Mike, for coming in today because I am, I'm really excited, A, to help the OCD family community understand more about ICBT, but also I'm excited to really understand this a little better. So thank you so much for being with us. I am really happy to be here, and I'm very excited that people are interested. And so let's take something that sounds complicated and make it simple. I am all for that. So we will go ahead and just roll right into that, Mike. How do you explain ICBT to help provide a simpler understanding of what exactly it is? So that is the question. And I find that that question leads to other questions, which is sort of a natural process. So we'll, we'll take some time to unpack it. Sure. But as you mentioned, so you know, ICBT, right? You said inference-based CBT. So inference, the first word. From this perspective, this process of OCD begins with an obsessional doubt. Mm -hmm. And when we say obsessional doubt, we mean inference of doubt. Now I realize I just said something complicated. So let me unpack that. An inference of doubt is the conclusion to doubt something in the here and now. It is a reasoning process. It is a cognitive process, an active process of thinking where I have taken a look at something and decided to doubt it. Okay. That is the beginning of OCD from this model. So everything follows from that conclusion to doubt, right? The consequence, the emotion of anxiety and panic and shame, and then ultimately the compulsion, all of it follows from this present moment conclusion to doubt something. And we call it obsessional because that process, that reasoning process is ultimately, we, we could call it a reasoning narrative as, as I think it's more aptly captured, is actually faulty. Okay. So quick question for you. Would you say inference, would it be interchangeable with kind of perception? 
or is that like to because I think sometimes for people perception is a little easier to click with but is it is that is that a (laughs) no-no oh well I think that might muddy the waters just a little bit because there's already some myths out there that people with OCD have problems with perception ah okay they don't there's an abundant amount of research that tells us that people with OCD, they are fine with their memories. They are fine with their five senses. It's that they distrust those tools. Okay. They distrust those things that actually, you know, conjure reality for us. How else can we determine something to be real other than perceiving the present moment through our senses and through common knowledge? And so people with OCD don't have a deficit or a broken part of their experience where they perceive problematically. No, they don't. They perceive just fine. They doubt their perception in highly specific areas, obsessional areas. Okay. So the distinction, and I I like that you pointed out that it muddies the water. I'm probably going to make a lot of muddy water to try and understand this, but I I think that this is going to be a great opportunity to kind of clear out some of the gunk. So perception is more of a kind of pejorative, broad sweeping term than if we were to just kind of deduce this to a perception problem, because really we're looking at very, very specific little slices, little examples where the inference is getting to this obsessional place. Right. So, yeah, we could we could make the argument that the faulty inference, right, the faulty conclusion, right, there's a faulty reasoning narrative that has told us to doubt our perception right now. Okay. That's what we're talking about. So obsessional doubt. Right. To not trust our instincts then. To not trust what's going, eh, instincts. Yeah, yeah. Instincts (laughs) is another one of those things where, because instincts are highly susceptible to emotion. Emotion is a highly problematic way of concluding reality, right? Because our emotions can be manipulated through movies and music. And, you know, what we want to say is, is that our perception pretty rigidly defined as our five senses and our common sense, right? Detected in the here and now gets doubted because of a story, right? And that story didn't just happen to you. It wasn't delivered to you by Amazon, right? (laughs) You created that story through a reasoning process. And it's a faulty reasoning process because of how it was created. And the one thing we're going to hear a lot in our conversation about ICBT is the word story or narrative. And the reason we talk about it is because the obsessional doubting arrives as a reasoning narrative, right? It is, it is not like a, a set of bullet points that show up in our head. It comes through the nature of it is a story, which that narrative process creates a veil of credibility for this doubt. Okay. Right. And that's the problem is that that doubt becomes trusted. Yeah. And, you know, and at times, and I am it's obvious for our OCD family community, I practice ERP, but often at times in treatment, I will use the, the phrasing of the story that OCD would have us believe. And so it's ringing a bell for me there in terms of, yeah, again, there is a story, a narrative that you're inferring about very specific thoughts that are now giving that idea of credibility to your experience because that is the story that you're focused on. Is that correct? I would say, yeah, that that's closer. pretty, yeah, that's, that's much closer, Getting right? And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to nickel and dime no, no. words here, right? But OCD, right? If we arrive at a conclusion to doubt, an obsessional doubt, mm-hmm. an inference of doubt, through this reasoning narrative process, we begin to distrust what reality is telling us, right? right. We begin to distrust what our five senses and our common sense tell us. We begin to distrust what we know about this present moment. And we start to favor what could be. We start to favor and trust and overinvest in what hypothetically might be or otherwise trust our imagination, right? So that's actually the definition of inferential confusion, which again is another $20 word. <laughs> if I can give you some change back on that, right? Inferential confusion is the primary process 
that not only predicts for OCD, but if we treat it and reduce its intensity, people get better from OCD. So it's actually the change mechanism and inferential confusion is that narrative reasoning process, that faulty narrative reasoning process. And so it is the distrust of our five senses, the distrust of our common sense, ultimately the distrust of ourselves and an overinvestment in the hypothetical, the possible, or otherwise captured by the word imagination. So if we imagine this in a real world scenario, then if I, if I walk out my front door and I close the door and I turn the doorknob and I can visually see I've closed the door and then I stop and have the thought, but what if I didn't actually really close it? What if it didn't latch? That is an inferential confusion because I can see, I can feel that I just closed the door. I can hear that it maybe clicked or the lock went in place. But now it's, but what if I didn't? That's the imaginative piece where you might be kind of going, oh, well, now I'm feeling some anxiety and distress because even though I experienced all of this in real time and the evidence would be clear in most situations, I have that fear that, but what if I didn't? Yeah. And that, that, but what if I didn't, what if it wasn't actually closed? That's the point where we start to refer to it as the crossover point where the person has decided that I know what a closed door feels like. I know what a closed door sounds like. I know what a closed door looks like. Mm -hmm. And now I'm actually going to think that, that, that those things might not be good enough because what if it's not closed? It possible that it's not closed, right? I've, I've, I've maybe not closed the door before people don't close doors sometimes and they think they do now we're engaged in this process that is problematic. This is where the problem begins, right? So the problem doesn't begin with closing the door. Mm -hmm. The door is the prompt, right? It's, it's the trigger for then the, what if to show up now, if the, what if begins to be trusted and in an OCD, it's already there. Right. right. That, that, what if doesn't have to be, you, you started trusting that. What if the second it popped into your head, we can talk about why, but it then leads to acting as if, right. Not acting as if the door is closed, not acting as if my eyes work just fine, acting as if they don't right acting as if the door isn't closed. And then I start to think of all the consequences of if the door isn't closed. And then I start to feel anxious and panicky. And then I feel like I need to stare at the door, right? Right. And the idea of staring at the door is a distrust of your senses. We don't, that's not how you use our senses normally. We don't stare to know what we're looking at. We know what we're looking at. Staring is an indication of not trusting your senses. Okay. So we have that crossover point when we start acting on the what if, if I'm understanding, like, you know, in terms of whether it's problem solving, seeking reassurance, whatnot, to try and solve the what if. And you said when it pops into your brain, that's you're already engaged in it. And so I would love for you to talk about that a little more because I think that would sure. be helpful. Yeah. So ICBD has many different facets, all of which are about understanding inferential confusion and reducing it, understanding the obsessional doubt and having us not rely on it anymore. And so when people come to my office with great frequency, I, I hear the question at some point, why do I have this obsession mm -hmm. and not some others, right? I mean, of all the obsessions I could have, I don't have those. I have these. Why? And, you know, we know that that's not an accident. We know that that's not just bad luck. We know that OCD tends to quote, attack what you care about. Right. But ICBT gives you a mechanism explaining the why and the how it goes after that. Well, I, it, I'm ready for that. <laughs> so it talks about what they call vulnerable self themes. And that's an ICBT phrase, vulnerable self themes, otherwise understood as feared possible self. Hmm. Now to understand this, we have to understand that the feared possible self is in opposition to the real self. Okay. who we actually are, the authentic version of us, there is a feared version of us. And it's kind of like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right? Where 
where we know we're Dr. Jekyll, but what if we become Mr. Hyde, right? So this idea of, of feared possible selves or vulnerable self themes is yet another narrative about who we could become or might secretly be, mm -hmm. right? That we are also inferentially confused with, meaning that we have the same reasoning, the arid reasoning process applying to who we think we could be. Mm -hmm. And, and it, this is said to be formed sometime in adolescence when a lot of sort of self formation is beginning, right? Identity is forming. Mm -hmm. And this creates a kind of surveillance process, a kind of vulnerability that we keep an eye out for in our day to day moments. So I can give you a, a, a clear clinical example if that's okay. I would love that. Bring it on. Let's take, <laughs> let's take the person who might have a, what I think is a somewhat classic case of OCD. We, we sometimes refer to it as hit and run OCD. Yeah. Right. So sometimes it's kind of a kind of harm OCD. Mm -hmm. So you imagine the person who's driving down the road and they're driving down the road that a thousand other people have driven down. Right. Yeah. And, you know, as they're driving, they're noticing the road the way they always notice the road. They're Let's say they're a decent enough driver. They don't have a history of, of running people over, right? <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> so far, so good, right? And then they run over a pothole. And they think to themselves, I could have been a person. Mm -hmm. And immediately that person is captivated, lost, absorbed is a word we use. Absorbed into that idea, into that narrative. And then they begin thinking of the consequences. Well, if it was a person then, and this is the loud part that they pay attention to, they could be dying on the side of the road and it could be my fault. I'm to blame. I'm responsible. I need to go and check and see if there's a body on the side of the road. Let me turn around and go check, right? This is somewhat of a typical hit and run OCD presentation. Now that person might say, why do I have this obsession? Why this and not something else? Mm -hmm. Why did I hit that speed bump and, and not just have the thought, man, that's going to mess up my rim, mm -hmm. right? Which is what the thousand people before them thought. Right. What does it mean about thought. me that I thought it was a person? I must be a psychopath or, you know, whatever. And now we're getting at it, which is that this person has a vulnerable self theme. It's pre-existing, if you will. It's there before they hit the bump. It is a sense of self that I feel vulnerable about or vulnerable to that I'm keeping an eye on. I'm keeping a surveillance for. Now, you don't know you're doing it, right? It's like below the radar. But mm -hmm. what if I'm the kind of person who could be negligent? If I'm the kind of person who could be negligent, and then I just hit a speed bump, well, that could have been a person. Mm -hmm. So you can see how this follows for people, right? So it is this notion that I have this pre-existing vulnerable self mm -hmm. that I am sort of aware of, I'm anxious about maybe. At the very least, it is sort of in the background operating as a kind of, I'm keeping a surveillance after something in this ballpark, yeah. right? Not these other ballparks, because I don't care about that stuff. I care about this stuff. And if it's in the ballpark of negligence or responsibility or morality, being a good person, then anything in the present moment that could potentially trigger that theme means I am susceptible to becoming inferentially confused about this moment yeah, and not about all the others in my day. Yeah. Well, and so this is kind of reminding me of the concept of perceptual reality in which you're looking around kind of the reality and finding the reinforcing moments that are going to validate or further your thought. And again, perception is not the right word to use in this. Stop it, Nicole. But it's like, that's apparently very ingrained for me. So there's inferential confusion. And you brought up a really important point too, in this ballpark, not all of these other ballparks, because there are certain things, and in the ERP world, we would say there are a number of things we have uncertainty about, but there are certain areas where our obsessions get really stuck on the uncertainty here when really it's all around us. It sounds like you're kind of referencing that in the ballpark example, but uncertainty is not really the, the, the correct terminology in ICBT from what I've read. 
And so any ICBT people out there, we're, we'll, we'll, we'll correct the record here. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it gets really confusing. So can you talk a little bit to that piece? Because I know that actually there are, it, rather than uncertainty, certain functional certainty. And I might have just muddied it up. So you can help help me understand and break that down. Sure. Well, I think if we can go back to basics here, right, Nate, we talk about an inference of doubt being an active reasoning process, which is not an emotion, right? Like when people talk about uncertainty, they're usually talking about a feeling. the distress that occurs because they can't seem to know something for sure. Mm -hmm. That's a feeling, mm -hmm. right? And so people with OCD might have hit a bump and thought it was a person. And then they go, I feel uncertain. How can I remove all of my uncertainty? How can I know for sure? Mm -hmm. Right. And in, in this, in this situation from an ICBT standpoint, we would say that tolerating that feeling, mm -hmm. not trying to resolve that feeling, which is a pretty common sort of non-engagement response, right? Tolerate not knowing. Right. Yeah. Which is, which is fine from an ERP standpoint, completely fine. Yeah. Right. If a, if a person can get there, they'll yeah. probably get better. Big thumbs right? up on non-engagement responses. It's just not ICBT. It's not what it's about, right? ICBT says that there was a creation or a conjuring up of a doubt that made you feel uncertain. A story showed up that you trusted that this could have been a person and you have a bunch of justifications for that story that make you feel uncertain about your current state of affairs. And that uncertainty is unwarranted because the doubt wasn't real. The doubt wasn't justified by reality. It was only justified by the imagination. It was only justified by, by hypothetical could be's and maybe's, but not an ounce of reality in the here and now. Right. And, and so ICBT aims to resolve said doubt by bringing someone back to five senses certainty common sense certainty. We have certainty in our senses as they detect the world around us. And we all have it. Meaning most of us don't have to actively think, I know I'm breathing air right now. And let me give you 10 justifications for why I know it's air. Reality hits you between the eyes. It doesn't need justification. It just is. So our five senses are constantly keeping us alive and keeping us safe and working very well. Right. Right. Hopefully. And so we have certainty in our senses and their ability to detect the present moment accurately because they do so everywhere else all the time and they're great. And then in this moment, the OCD story has caused you to doubt that, to doubt what works perfectly normally. And the reason they're causing you to doubt that is through a whole bunch of clever narrative, rhetorical devices, through justifications. And here comes the huge emotional experience of responsibility and uncertainty and panic. And all of that, again, creates this veil of credibility, perpetuates this veil of credibility that the doubt must be correct because all of this bad stuff is happening inside my body. Mm -hmm. So again, the uncertainty doubt issue here is really just talking about two different models and how they understand change mechanisms, right? From an ERP model. And I would say it's not ERP practiced across the world. There are plenty of places that do ERP that don't talk about uncertainty at all, right? A lot of places, in, including Canada and in, in, in Europe, it is the inflation of responsibility mm -hmm. that's, that's actually talked about way more than uncertainty. So uncertainty is a little bit more U.S. specific. But again, there's something wrong with that in the ERP model if the client can get there, right? right? The issue would be if they can't get there and we're like, but you have to, to get better. Mm. Well, we, from the ICBT standpoint, we know that not to be an accurate statement. So tolerating uncertainty, fine, if you can get there, there's nothing wrong with it. It's this idea that it doesn't resolve inferential confusion directly. So it's not ICBT at all. Right. So ICBT says... There is a doubt that was created that never needed to be there. Yeah. That doubt got trusted because of a whole bunch of clever tricks that this con man was playing on you, mm -hmm. right? And that made you feel uncertain. Mm -hmm. And an analogy I can use is 
I've woken up from incredibly vivid and absorbing dreams mm -hmm. where I have felt every range of emotion from panic to guilt to elation. Mm -hmm. And none of those emotions were relevant to reality. Right. Why? Because it was a dream. Mm -hmm. So the idea of uncertainty being relevant to reality, if it was the product of a story that was false, ICBT says, the work is on helping you realize the story was false. And then it resolves the rest of the sequence. It resolves the urge to do a compulsion. It resolves the uncertainty because you come back to trust and certainty in the five senses and its ability to detect reality. Okay. And I, I like the, I like the idea of kind of thinking about the dream sequence because dreams are different narratives that will play out when we're in rapid eye movement, when we're sleeping. And sometimes a lot of OCD themes can play out in people's dreams because your brain doesn't just stop being your brain just because you're resting or trying to rest. But most of us can say, unless you're a lucid dreamer and that's a whole nother thing, but most of us can say, like, I realize that that is a narrative. And even in lucid dreaming, you realize it's a narrative and can participate in that. And so... Really, you're pointing out that, you know, ERP is looking at treatment from a behavioral standpoint, whereas it sounds like ICBT is really taking that cognitive appraisal route and before you even get into all the feelings. Because whether you feel distressed or not doesn't mean I didn't see and feel myself close the door. I just feel distress. And so ERP looks at it in terms of exploring those feelings and the classical conditioning model and, and stimulus response, whereas ICBT is going to look at the narrative, the false narrative or faulty inference that kind of perpetuated this in a vulnerable space for you. And so it's really going to be going behind the feelings before you get to the presenting distress. Is that right? Absolutely. Oh, so so there's, there's, the, there's a few things that I think would be helpful to sort of to, to clarify which, mm -hmm. and maybe we could have started with this, but again, we talk about ICBT questions, but get questions and it's just, it, it's an investment of time. And so here we are taking the time from an ICBT perspective, OCD is not an exaggerated phobic response. Mm -hmm. That's not the primary problem mm -hmm. from an ICBT perspective. OCD is not an anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. That is not the primary problem. Those things exist. There is phobic responding. There is anxiety because there are clearly compulsions and anxiety, but that's not the key. The key is the doubting, okay. which precedes all of that. So if we think about this in a sequence from the ICBT model, ICBT says OCD is the doubting disorder and not the emotion doubting, the mm -hmm. verb. Right. I am actively in inferring doubt. I am concluding doubt. I have decided through a bunch of clever narrative and tricky storytelling devices to, to conclude doubt about something in this here and now moment. And everything seems to follow from that. So if there was no doubt, if that doubt was completely not trusted, you just brushed it off your shoulder and went, well, that's weird. And you truly believe that there would be no consequences emotions or compulsions. It would just move on. As I said, if the guy driving down the road hit the pothole and thought, man, that might ruin my, my rim. Right. Everything's gone. Everything's done. There is no, what if I hit a person? Let me figure out if I did. Let me resolve feelings. Let me resolve compulsions. So it begins with the doubt. The first domino that gets kicked over is the doubt. So again, ICBT says we're not dealing with primary issues of phobic responses or anxiety disorder responses, they are there, but they're all byproducts of a pre-existing doubt process, which leads me into my second thing that we should clarify, if that's okay. Oh, please. You used the word appraisal. And of course, you know, families listening to this are not going to care about this, but clinicians are, <laughs> right? Yes. Appraisal is a model of OCD that came about in the eighties, um, people, big, big name people, Jack Rackman being one of them, yeah. um, who did one of the original 
Rackman and De Silva, 1978, the original article that published saying we all have intrusive thoughts, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And and if we all have it, it's normal. Mm -hmm. And and so can something normal be the problem? Can something normal be what causes OCD? Well, no. We have to explain how the normal becomes problematic, how the normal becomes obsessive, and how they explained that was you evaluate the intrusion, the normal intrusion. You appraise the normal intrusion as being threatening, dangerous, intolerable, meaningful. And then that process is what creates the obsession. So there's an appraisal model out there that says there's normal intrusive thoughts that you then appraise or evaluate as problematic. And that's how an obsession comes to be. And actually today, most people who treat OCD blend the behavioral and that appraisal model together. Mm -hmm. Most people, when they explain, well, how an obsession comes to be, mm -hmm. they aren't talking about classical conditioning. True. They're talking about, well, there's this intrusive thought. I mean, look at every Instagram post on the planet about OCD and everyone's talking about intrusive thoughts and they're normal and they're not wrong from that model. Right. But ICBT goes, intrusions aren't what causes obsessions. Intrusions, in fact, are a bit of a red herring. They exist for everyone, but people with OCD don't have obsessions because of intrusions necessarily. They have obsessions because they have an inference process occurring with specific experiences. And this inference process, what was observed by Kieran O'Connor in, in when he was working with Jack Rackman, which is an interesting history lesson here, these two you know, juggernauts yeah. in the world, Jack Rackman and Kieran O'Connor were working together. And O'Connor goes, I'm not entirely sold on this idea that intrusive thoughts are what become obsessions. And he observed that his patients were having what we would call if-then possibility statements, if-then propositions. Yeah. What if then? Right. That's not an intrusive thought. That's a process. That's that's an assessment of, or I could say that's a that's a narrative reasoning process. And he went on to then try to, you know, publish something in 95, uh, the conceptual idea, inference is not intrusions or what's going on. And then they went on to actually publish experimental and other kinds of stuff. But I wanted to smooth that out simply for some of the listeners who are going, oh, this is just the appraisal model. And they're, they're calling it an inference, but really they're all just appraisals. No, no, no. From this perspective, they're actually quite different. Appraisals actually come later. Okay. Well, and I was going to say, but the, what you just said might answer it for me. So I was going to say, it's not so much a focus on what has been thought of as intrusive thoughts, but I was going to say the appraisal of the intrusive thought, but that would be a wrong way to categorize it if appraisal is coming later. Well, so if you're going to say appraisal of an intrusive thought would represent the standard model okay. correctly today, right? That's today. Correctly, the, the most commonly understood cognitive explanation of an obsession today is that there's an intrusive thought that's considered normal. Right. Think of it as just space junk floating around our brain that occasionally crashes into our atmosphere, our consciousness. And here comes this thought. Now it's unwanted. It came out of nowhere. It crashed into my consciousness. This is the appraisal model that's been around since the 80s. Okay. Right? What the ICBT group is talking about is that they're not intrusions. Intrusion is first a metaphor, right? right? It's a metaphor for a thought that somehow came to be and I didn't like it. But they don't explain the how and the why and the where. It's just, it's intrusive, right? right? We all have it. It's intrusive, which is to me, it's a little bit like, but how? Explain that. But ICBT says, oh, it's not an intrusive in the sense that like it bombarded into your consciousness. You were keeping an eye out for something in this ballpark because of your vulnerable self theme. You were vulnerable to this kind of thought being reasoned with. It wasn't a random crashing of space junk into your consciousness. You were keeping an eye out for something in this ballpark. What if I could be the kind of person who's negligent? If that is something that I am invested in, and this is something that I am on the lookout for, kind of low key, covert, I don't know I'm doing it, but I am. Yeah. Then it's kind of like, you know, we're not on the lookout for gunshots. Right. But when we hear, we know it's dangerous. Right. Right. We're, we, we are low key on the lookout for this person I could be. I could be a negligent, violent, dangerous person. And if I believe that, 
if I'm invested in that version of me, I am already on the lookout for things that would be in that ballpark. So these aren't intrusions. These aren't some random thoughts. These are actually quite obsessional, right? Mm -hmm. And, and so it's, it's, again, this might be something that people have to, to chew on for a little bit and, and wrap their heads around. But the, the notion that these are, you know, normal, that they're random, that there's nothing we can do about them or that we should ignore them is not what ICBT is working on. ICBT is working on, these are actually inferences that were selected. I selected to infer something about this moment and this topic because it was relevant to the person I thought I could become. Okay. So in looking at kind of that vulnerability, then it sounds like the more appropriate word and it kind of goes back to what you kind of just described OCD as the doubting disorder is to focus on doubt versus intrusive. Would that be right? Because doubt is at the base, kind of what is fueling the narrative. And if we resolve the the narrative, like if we look into the story or fix the story based on, I heard the door click, I saw myself pull it closed, I felt the pressure and the physics of all the things I would expect to feel when I close the door and we could fix that narrative, then everything else would also <laughs> resolve itself. Would that be right? Yes. And, and is it yes and caveat? Yes you know, and again, warmer, like, but not hot yet. <laughs> I feel like I get, I feel like I'm nickel and dimey the words here, but I do think it's important, right? So, it is. I, I'm glad you are. So. I love that you said we're, it's, it's the doubt. It's not the intrusion. Absolutely. Cause doubt is an active process. Again, doubt the verb, not doubt the feeling. Let's be incredibly clear about that. I am doubting, which is a reasoning process and I'm doubting in a faulty way. Right. And it's a narrative way. Again, that creates this, this really easy to sell doubt mm -hmm. because it's, it's packaged in a narrative. Mm -hmm. which we're already sort of, we already think in narratives, we construct reality in narratives. So here comes this other narrative that mm -hmm. I'm susceptible to. So yes, I like that you say this is an, a, a doubt, not an intrusion. A plus for that. I think that's perfectly right. Thank you. <laughs> I, a plus and. <laughs> yeah. And right. So, so Professor Hetty's coming in with some red ink on the notes of this, that's which is to say that we're not disputing or refuting your story. Mm. We're not saying your hands don't have Ebola on them. We're not saying that because we know that disputing and refuting the content of one's story is a fool's errand. It right. doesn't seem to help. I'm it's not saying compulsion. it never helps. It's a compulsion. It, it can be. And that's the problem here is, is like, it's not, a, it, it's not a compulsion because we said it's so. A compulsion must function as such. Right. So True. just because we go, oh, that's a compulsion, doesn't make it a compulsion, right? People say reassurance is a compulsion. No, it's not. Reassurance has to function as a compulsion before it's a compulsion. We will, family, we will get to that in a moment because I okay. don't want to hear him on the, on the rest of this point, but I think that's going to be confusing for a lot of ERP therapists and maybe families that are right. going well, through my, that. My point here would be like, let's not, let's not paint in broad brushes and yes. say that people with OCD don't deserve reassurance. People with OCD are people and they deserve a normal functional kind of reassurance. They just don't, do, they don't benefit from compulsive reassurance. That's very different. Okay. But I don't want to get sidetracked yes. on that. So not yet. <laughs> let's, right. Let's, let's try to clean this up. The idea, and this is a quote from the co-founder, Fred Ardema, who co-founded ICBT with Kieran O'Connor. Kieran passed away a few years ago, sadly. And Fred said, so from an ICBT lens, we're not trying to reason one out of their doubt. We're trying to help them realize they reasoned themselves into it, uh -huh. which is different and it's nuanced, right? Very so nuanced. we are talking about content, but only to serve the understanding of how this story was constructed mm -hmm. under false pretenses. The pretense was this must be real. Nope. It was never real. The story was always constructed on very hypothetical, imagined, possibility-based frameworks, not through my five senses, not through anything we would consider here and now reality. And so 
We're not trying to go, let's argue your way out of this narrative with a new narrative. We're not having a, a, a dueling narrative, <laughs> right? What we're trying to do is go, hey, do you see how you arrived at this decision to doubt through this really absorbing narrative? I mean, no wonder you, you doubted. No wonder you doubt. Of course you doubted. This was a really convincing. I've been convinced by clients doubt before, right? They've tricked me and I'm the therapist. So <laughs> if they're tricking me and it's not even my stuff, how, how easily is it that they're going to get absorbed, right? right? So I can empathize with that and say, you reasoned your way into it, right? Which is a wonderful piece of news because if you can realize you reasoned yourself into it, we can take a look behind the curtain and just ask ourselves if that reasoning is the kind of reasoning we would want to teach our kids, the kind of reasoning I use in every facet of my life, or is it some other kind of reasoning? And what we discover is that it's some other kind of reasoning, a reasoning that should never have been trusted. We already don't trust that reasoning everywhere else in our life. We only trust it here. Mm. And that's the point ICBT is making. It's let's help you discover that if this is OCD, then the doubt was obsessional. If the doubt is obsessional, it's not rooted and constructed from here and now reality. It is constructed from the imagination or the hypothetical. And it's done so because this process was narrative in nature. It just, it slid through the door. It had a really good fake ID and it got into the club, <laughs> right? And and we can show you how that occurred, right? The common analogy we're using is, I can show you how the magician is doing the trick. Yeah. So you don't have to go, huh, guess I have to tolerate not knowing how he did that trick. Yeah. No, I can know how he did the trick and then I can just not. So if the, if the magician's levitating, I can go, well, that's not real. Yeah. Not only is it not real, I know how he did it. That's right. what ICBT is trying to teach you. So we're not trying to say Ebola isn't on your hands. We're not trying to say, you know, let's argue with the content of your thought, which a lot of people might hear when they hear about sort of a cognitive approach to OCD. We're trying to help people realize that they, they reasoned themselves into a doubt, mm -hmm. right? And, and once you realize that, you can spot it and you can go, I'm not going to reason myself into this doubt anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not going to believe the trick. I'm going to believe what I know is the mechanics of how the trick is functioning. And I can spend time on that or not, but I have a different, I have a different worldview in a way, a different inference. <laughs> it, 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 what's interesting is it's not even a different worldview. You already have this worldview and everywhere used, else. Right. And it's used correctly in other places. So really- We're just yeah, yeah, we're just saying bring what you do normally everywhere else. You reason normally, you perceive normally everywhere else in your life, everywhere else in your day, except around the OCD stuff. And the reason you don't do it normally in the OCD stuff is because you got conned into distrusting it here. And we're trying to help you realize don't trust the con. See it as a con. See it as a con. See it as the, yeah, yeah, as the con. And it... So correct me if I'm wrong. I'm I'm going for another A plus, so I'm feeling pretty good about it. <laughs> Not that perfection is the thing, but it's really then this process of normalizing the abnormality that you are using this faulty inference of doubt in this highly selective area, though you use it appropriately and correctly and deduce exactly what you should deduce in other areas in other ballparks, but in this ballpark, you're having a faulty inference of doubt. So it's normalizing that it's not normal because we say a lot in ERP, everybody has intrusive thoughts from time to time. And so instead it's like, no, like you, you have great thoughts, banner thoughts, way to go team thoughts. Most times this thought, this highly selective thought that is kind of preying on this vulnerability of what if I could be a bad person, and you see this inference, this faulty inference, as I guess you would say, a doubt. What if this means that I'm not good? What if this means that, you know, I could run over somebody? Now, now it's gone into abnormality. Yeah? Right. Yeah. So what we would say here is just that all inferences of doubt that are obsessional are abnormal. Mm -hmm. because by definition, the obsessional doubt, and we can unpack this too with examples, 
is obsessional doubt is not constructed the way normal doubts or normal uncertainties are constructed, meaning they lack a basis in reality. And again, reality that's relevant to the here and now. Mm -hmm. And so I can unpack that with an example, but that's, yeah, your example is, is accurate. Mostly there. <laughs> yeah, it's mostly there, right? You know, inferential confusion. I know I keep bringing this word up and I hope people, you know, don't get annoyed with it because I know it's a complicated phrase, but inferential confusion, AKA obsessional narratives of doubt, right? Mm -hmm. Is, is a, is a framework of that we all have, we all have some level of inferential confusion. There's actually a scale where you can evaluate. And we in the ICBT community encourage all therapists to do this because therapists can be inferentially confused as well, not just lived experience therapists, right? So you don't have to have a diagnosis of OCD to have inferential confusion. Sure. It just happens to be that when you have high levels of inferential confusion, right? When you are that much more susceptible or vulnerable to distrusting your senses and favoring what's imagined and what could be, when you have a high level of that, it almost certainly predicts OCD. Yeah. Which is different than other frameworks where we talk about different cognitive domains, inflated responsibility, overimportance of thoughts, intolerance of uncertainty, perfectionism. These don't predict OCD. They predict almost all of the anxiety disorders, major depression, and sometimes OCD. But inferential confusion predicts OCD and it actually farms out the other anxiety disorders. So high levels of inferential confusion is almost entirely, or I say almost because nothing is perfect, but almost entirely predicting OCD. And when we treat it, when we bring that level of, of inferential confusion below what we would consider clinical levels, we see Y box scores drop, mm. which, so we're seeing this sort of recognition that maybe inferential confusion is the thing that's going wrong with OCD and not anxiety and avoidance. Those things are perpetuating the problem. They're keeping the story alive. They're keeping the doubt trusted. So they're clearly worth attacking, but the primary issue might be inferential confusion that started this entire process off from the get-go. So you're using the, the word might be, and I'm wondering then, you know, in the relationship between the two, the, the inferential confusion and the Y box score, for example, is that then, are we saying that that is a correlation for now in the research? Or is it, it sounds like if might, then I'm thinking not causal. So what is the relationship? Because we here on, at the community have been talking more about research and understanding how this fits with evidence-based, which ICBT is evidence-based. But I just want to try and understand that if we're saying that might be a factor, if that might be a variable, how, how can we understand that relationship then between the right. two? Right. So, so yeah, and the, the words might be are usually my attempt at, at qualifying something because I don't speak in certainties and nor does research, right? Research doesn't speak in certainties. But, and again, there's people out there that speak research so much better than me and that know this stuff so much better than me, but here's my stab at it. I've read most of it, not cover to cover, but I've read most of it. To date, there are over 85 peer-reviewed articles for ICBT. That, that means we've looked at vulnerable self-theme as a construct and we've replicated it and independent labs have done so. We've looked at, I say we as if I've done any of this, Fred and Kieran and, and oui. dozens of others of researchers. But inferential confusion itself has been validated as a construct several times over. There is experimental data. So it's not just correlational data. There's experimental data mm -hmm. that suggests inferential confusion is a stronger predictor of OCD than, than what we currently understand to be out there. Now, we always like more research. We always like more validation. And we're not going to get to a place, at least not in my lifetime, where we have some sense of like, it's absolutely certain there's no doubts. But what we do have is, is incredibly strong data that continues to be reinforced that inferential confusion, as they've termed it, right, yeah. is highly specific to OCD, mm -hmm. that it is a very real thing. It's distinct from a, a sense of threat perception. 
right? So they've done research where they've pulled these things out. So they call them factorally different. Mm -hmm. And the factor, that factor analysis, which is a clever statistical process where they've actually said, is this really a distinct thing or are we just capturing something and calling it something else? No, it's a distinct thing. And it seems to be quite relevant to OCD. Now, again, this, is, this feels new to us here. This isn't new to people in the research world, right? right? The, first, the first time inferential confusion was validated was, I think, in 99. The first time we saw the inferential confusion questionnaire develop was in 05, 03, 05. I might be getting my... That's a long time ago. Yeah. Right? And they've translated this into multiple languages. They validated it several times over. So it's a real thing, right? Yeah. And so, although it's a complicated phrase for people to hear the first time, this is an incredibly researched and understood mechanism. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that, that learning theory is wrong, right? Inferential confusion doesn't invalidate learning theory. It's saying that there is a sequence in which case these things arise. So from this model, we would say the inferential confusion, the vulnerable self theme, these things predate what the ERP is seeing in the here and now, which is a person is engaged in incredible avoidance behaviors or compulsive behaviors mm -hmm. as a reaction to a negative emotional state or a scary thought. And that's keeping it going. It's absolutely true. No one's saying that's not true. What we're saying is, is that happens after someone had bought into a story. Yeah. Right. That's what we're saying. So essentially we're looking at two different sides of the same coin. We're looking on one side at the behavioral piece and the feelings that are manifesting through what we would describe in the ERP world as this intrusive thought and the intrusive nature of those thoughts, the fear response. And then on the other side of the coin, before we ever get to any kind of feeling, you're looking at inferential confusion and really, uh, okay, I'm going to try, I'm going to try, Mike, <laughs> keep me on track if this is wrong, but Inferential confusion, which would be kind of like thinking of our susceptibility maybe to having unhelpful reasoning strategies in highly specific areas because overall we might have amazing reasoning. So I got thumbs up, you guys. Yes, you couldn't see double, it. Yay. Double thumbs up. Double yes, thumbs. absolutely. Okay. Right. So if we, if we all have the capacity for this kind of reasoning error, that's normal, right? Great. Right. We're not saying there's a defect in you. We're saying that you have too much of that, right? Yeah. And so too much inferential confusion, too much investment in that kind of reasoning, right? We use investment to signify clinical unhelpful levels of inferential confusion. We want to bring it down. Yeah. Right. And, and yeah, that's such a, such an important thing for you to come to the awareness of, right? Is like, you're getting it. And this is, again, this is a 45 minute hour long conversation. This is what the goal of this is, is to get people to sort of going, okay, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. So inferential confusion is X. Okay. That's the definition, right? Conflating what is possible with what is really happening now, mm -hmm. right? That's sort of a layman's definition of it. Mm -hmm. And if I have too much of that, right? I have, you can have a little bit, you know, if, some, if I have too much of that, I am probably going to have OCD clinically. And if I have too much of it as it applies to this highly specific situation, Mm -hmm. That seems to be selected for by a highly specific feared version of who I could be, mm -hmm. feared version of me, right, of vulnerable self-theme. Then the resolution comes from reducing one's level of inferential confusion, reducing one's investment in the hypothetical and increasing one's investment in the five senses here and now reality. Mm -hmm. But in inferential confusion, those are reversed. Right. Okay. Yes. I think, I think I'm, I think I'm tracking it a little bit. And, you know, with this then, because a lot of the work in the ERP version of this on that side of the coin, there's a lot of doing the exposure work and going in and exposing ourselves to the distress and practicing response prevention, which is not engaging in our compulsions. And that that will lead to ultimately lower kind of units of distress or feelings of distress. But it sounds like from an ICBT standpoint, then you wouldn't even necessarily need to do exposures. Am I, am I thinking about that correctly? 
Well, yes, and not just theoretically, but that's what the outcome research is showing us, right? So when they have open trials of the ICBT treatment process, they have three randomized controlled trials. There's a fourth and a fifth on the way. So this mm -hmm. is tested that people don't have to engage in exposures. Now, exposures traditionally are defined, right, as prolonged, deliberate provocation of distress, mm -hmm. either in vivo, mm -hmm. right, or imaginal. And in vivo being in real time, like in the yes. here and now. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So ICBT doesn't require that. It's not hostile to that because there is research suggesting that exposures in those ways can reduce inferential confusion. Right. But it's not required, right? If someone could get to the point where they've done the work, they've revealed the dream and woken up from the dream, they've, right, they've spotted the con artist tricks and they no longer invest in them, they might not need to do any of that exposure work, that deliberate, effortful, and I would even say even response prevention from an ERP model is often framed as an effortful thing, right? Like you have to try to resist your compulsions. That's effortful, right? Because not Very doing- effortful. <laughs> Very effortful. Right. And, and in ICBT, the, the process of not engaging in a compulsion comes as a natural byproduct. It isn't effortful. I no longer believe the con artist's crap. So I don't feel like it's an effortful process to stop the compulsion. It just occurs. And that's when things work out well. Yeah. Of course, any model doesn't always work out well. There are plenty of reasons why ICBT might falter, why ERP might falter, why any treatment process might falter, in which case someone could then say, well, let's try ERP then. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. That might be what gets people better. So you can start with ICBT, give it a good go. Doesn't seem to be getting traction. Try ERP. You can go ERP and say, let's try this. And that's not giving you traction. Let's try ICBT. But yes, ICBT is a non-exposure model, meaning it doesn't rely on habituation, inhibitory learning, effortful response prevention, or effortful exposure. That's pretty radical. I mean, in terms of thinking about it, but in another way, this, this might, you tell me if my logic is, is gone, but I'm going to throw it out. I feel good confidence in it. In another way, so before Mike and I came on, we were talking about yogurt, right? And a lot of yogurt has probiotics in it. It's great. We didn't necessarily cover that, but it's true. But a lot of yogurt is going to be cow's milk type of yogurt. Unless you go and seek out a specific or need to because of the way that your body functions, need to go and find a different version of yogurt. But it's all yogurt. And so ERP might be the more standard cow's milk yogurt here. And some people may really click with it. Some people may have to go over to the coconut milk yogurt. But a lot of people could do both. And it can just end up being a preference of what kind of makes sense and, and is the right fit. Would that work? Or am I just like, am I? Yeah. I, no, I think it's a good analogy, right? Again, we can let the scientists battle it out over what the real predictive mechanism of change really is, right? We have evidence that ERP reduces inferential confusion. So it's entirely plausible that the real change mechanism of, of successful OCD treatment is a reduction in inferential confusion. It could also be found that there's a significant role for habituation and inhibitory learning, mm -hmm. right? The scientists can sort of battle it out over the next three decades, right? As we both get really old. Um, <laughs> but in the meantime, we need to help people today, tomorrow, and next week. Yeah. And what we want to say is, is, you know, hey, these are two evidence-based treatments that really work, yeah. right? And, and I don't necessarily have to be like, this works and you have to agree with why it works. Yeah. Right. That's not the, the game I'm in. I'm not a researcher. You know, ultimately like it, it, it scratches the curiosity of why it works for me. But ultimately as my clients get better, they don't care. My clients will sit around and go, I got better because of habituation. <laughs> so I'm more moral than you or virtuous than you. It doesn't matter. They got better. Now, how we deliver treatment 
should be somewhat consistent to our process, right? So what informs our process? So if you're practicing from an ICBT perspective and you start doing exposures, you're probably thinking exposures are facilitating a reduction in inferential confusion, right? Which means they're functioning more from a behavioral experiment perspective. Mm -hmm. They're changing cognitions or believability of cognitions or investment in the story by challenging it behaviorally. Mm -hmm. And if you're an ERP behavior learning theory person, it boils down to habituation and inhibitory learning. And that's fine, right? Again, people have gotten better from ERP from those models. So it might not be that you got better because of how I understood them to work. You just got better through the process. We don't quite understand all the nooks and crannies of how exposures work. We know that they work. Right. Right. And the ICBT model seems to be pretty clear because it only targets inferential confusion, but that's how it works. Does that mean there won't be some revelation in a couple of years that there's a nuance to that? I don't know. Maybe that's for someone else more research oriented than me to figure out. But yes, we can absolutely look at this and say, if you got better from ERP for whatever reason, isn't that great? That is great. Yeah. Lots of people for a very long time got better with ERP, but I don't want to sit here and be all Pollyanna-ish about it. If we're being honest, when we take a look at the good data, not a single study, when we look at good data, most of the good reviews, so we're looking at, there's a handful of studies that have come out in the last four or five years that have given us a pretty clear picture that ERP, as it is practiced in the research, gets people clinically significant reductions in their Y-box scores, so clinically significant response, 60-ish percent of the time. Some studies may say a little less, some studies, I'm going to give an average and say around 60% of the time. So that means 40% of people in those studies don't. Right. So, so those people don't get better or they don't get as better. Right. What's the, what's the solution for those people? And then that doesn't even include the people who never signed up for that study because the word exposure was involved in the first place. Right. Right. So there's a lot of people out there who are struggling, who Maybe if they found the exact right kind of ERP at the right titration with the right charismatic therapist at the right time in their life, they might get better. But that's a whole lot of stars aligning. Right. What we want to do is go, hey, we don't have to wait for that star to align, right? We don't, have, we don't have to wait for Mercury to be in retrograde for the ERP to suddenly work for you. We can try something new now. Yeah. And, and, and that's really what we're trying to say is like no model is, is more moral or more virtuous than the other. What we're trying to say is that both get people better. And I'm hopefully doing a good job trying to convince people that ICBT is another very well-researched, very robust, effective model that sees OCD in a slightly more nuanced perspective than the ERP folks. And again, I, I do a lot of ERP myself, so I don't know that I can say ERP folks are different from me. I am them as well, right? I treat OCD and not an ERP therapist, right? I treat OCD. And a lot of people haven't heard of this. A lot of people are a little bit reactive, maybe defensive of this. I get it. I was too. But we're not talking about crystals. We're not talking about, you know, trying to cure you through celery juice. It's a very well-researched process. It doesn't happen to require exposures. And the change mechanism isn't appearing to be habituation or inhibitory learning. It appears to be a reduction in inferential confusion, which seems to set the whole thing in motion. And I think it's helpful to explain, you know, I think kind of a parallel that I can draw on something we talk about here on the podcast quite a bit is, you know, whether it's between parents and children or spouses or whatnot, it's not you against the other person. It's us against OCD. And I very much believe that, you know, if we're using our logic that applies in almost every other circumstance, there's more than one way to solve a problem. You know, this isn't a math problem where it's two plus two is four, no matter what. But there are multiple ways to get to four, if I, even if I wanted to lean into that a little more. 
So right. Yeah. So in terms of it's not ERP versus ICBT, it's ERP and ICBT as strategies with research behind them that are able to attack OCD, that are able to provide hope. And again, similar to ERP, it's not always effective. ICBT is not going to work for everybody. Or we wouldn't even have OCD anymore. It'd be like cured and we'd be gone, right? Right, exactly. Right. But I think it is important and I think it's very radical. But if you've been in the ERP world as a, as a practitioner, it is very radical for me to wrap my mind around. But I do feel like I'm actually getting there, Mike. So thank you for that. Yeah, um, great. yeah. And and what I would say is, you know, as a client coming in, especially, you know, a lot of what we know from research is anywhere from 14 to 17 years, it might be before you even discover that what you're dealing with, this this distress or doubt and imaginal, you know, overload kind of exploration of these narratives. What we do know is it takes a long time for people to discover that they do have OCD and they've already been dealing with the distress and dealing with these faulty narratives, these faulty inferences for a very long time. So in terms of if you were a new client going into treatment and someone said, yeah, so we could either go for lots of drives and not check for dead bodies you know, and see if that works. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Or we could look at the other side of the coin and go, I think it's worth looking at some of those doubts. I feel like on the surface, there would be a lot of preference, I would imagine, to not just go drive imagining if I'm killing people or not. And that, so I think on the surface, if you think about it, and we put ourselves in our loved one's shoes, or maybe, you know, if you're a family member, a spouse, adult child to an adult parent suffering with this, you might go, oh, yeah, like they they really struggle not only with the exposures, but the response preventions. And as you said, Mike, it's very effortful. It's not effortless. It's very effortful. I would think that ICBT would have a lot of buy-in for new clients to say, okay, yeah, I'd love to start there. And it might be, you, you mentioned you do ERP as well, it might be something where you ebb and flow in and out of ERP and ICBT, depending on where we're kind of hitting some roadblocks or what's working better. And so I think, you know, it, it's not even necessarily it has to be one or the other. It could be both if I'm understanding correctly. Is that right, Mike? Yes, it can absolutely be both, right? I think any, any model would say don't abandon it too soon, right? You know, like if we can borrow the analogy of medications, how many clients have we worked with where they took a medication and then three days later gave up because it didn't work? Right. Right. Well, it wasn't supposed to work in three days. It's supposed to work in three months. Right. And so you got to sort of weather the storm and ERP isn't supposed to work in three sessions or six sessions. Right. right. So if someone goes, well, I did six sessions of ERP, it didn't work. Well, I mean, that's not a really good try of ERP, but if what they said was, I just, I'm completely and totally unwilling to do exposures. I will absolutely not do it. I will drop out of treatment before I do it. The answer isn't come back when you're ready. The answer is here's this other approach that doesn't require it. But I think you're right. If you were to give people this option, brand new OCD patient, here's two treatment options. And we've described them favorably, right? So we didn't say that the exposure one was a scary, terrifying, torturous thing, because it's not for a lot of people. It's, a, it's distressing, but it's often valued. You might get more people choosing the less distressing option, right? <laughs> right. You, uh, but there's a lot of factors that might make that different for different people. Like if you have a history of someone like for myself, who's had phobias, Mm -hmm. Phobias of heights and phobias of snakes and phobias of public speaking and that, that I can't think of anything more potent and effective than exposure. Mm -hmm. And I think the data is very clear about that with phobias. Mm -hmm. Nothing is as effective. Avoidance might be, but not in the long term. <laughs> right? right? It doesn't Avoidance necessarily... is probably, 
we'll Avoid- put Avoidance doesn't resolve the problem, but that's another no. issue for another day, right? Exactly. Like, <laughs> so, so if someone had a history of, say, successful exposure work, and then they are starting to work with OCD, they might just be like, I get exposure. Mm-hmm. I had a fear of the dark, and I had a fear of heights, and I had a fear of X, a fear of Y, and it was I successfully approached those things. They might do so much better at ERP because they're invested. They're not resistant or ambivalent, I should say. They, 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 they might choose ERP right out of the gate. Other people might go, I have a kind of OCD where the thoughts are so repugnant. The thoughts are so, so just torturous. It's not like an understandable kind of OCD. I have germs, right? Everyone gets germs, right? Mm-hmm. I have a kind of OCD where it's like, what if I'm a serial killer? What if I'm a pedophile? What if I'm a, what if I'm these sort of really difficult experiences? They might not choose ERP up front because we're going to have them purposefully exposed to circumstances they were previously avoiding and not doing the things they thought were keeping themselves and others safe. That's a really hard sell. I mean, I've tried to sell that to clients before and some bit and did really well and got better, but it was not an easy process. It's not easy. Well, yeah. And so you're saying, because in ERP, to some extent, we we will say or hear in the field that, you know, the obsessional thought, it is what it is. It's all just different kind of flavors of the same thing. But there are certain themes that can feel more stigmatizing. We've seen it a lot, for example, with pedophilia, OCD, when people have uttered anything, any kind of transparency in terms of struggling with that kind of thought or doubt, as we, depending which model we're looking at, there is a huge backlash because people just hear you want to, you want to molest or you want to assault babies, you want to assault children. And yeah, that sounds terrible. That's the person with that thought will be the first to tell you like, I don't like it, right? Like this is not, this is not egocentric. This isn't something that I want to do. And so I think that is a a really important point. And for certain themes, that could be really helpful. Thank you for that. Okay, so for today's intrusive thought segment, well, (laughs) this is a little bit awkward, isn't it? Because, okay, let's just call it what it is. My little tongue-in-cheek intrusive thought segment on Every episode, it is the last segment of my show where I like to provide some kind of application that we discuss from the talk, from our learning, from a person's experience. And I like to try and figure out a way to make it tangible and practical for us to use in the here and now. And ICBT has made it clear that it is not about the intrusions, right? So I'm having an intrusive thought segment about ICBT. Um, yeah, awkward. (laughs) But as Mike said, when we're looking at this from the lens of ICBT, intrusions aren't what cause obsessions, okay? Even if intrusive thoughts may exist for everyone, people with OCD don't have obsessions because of the intrusions necessarily. Mike went on to say, quote, they have obsessions because they have an inference process occurring with specific experiences, end quote. He went on to share about Kieran O'Connor's observations of patients having these if-then possibility statements or if-then propositions, he called them. You know, what, what if this happened? Then dot, dot, dot. And so we know from the ERP world that OCD tends to latch onto that which we value. In ICBT, at least in my layman's understanding of it thus far, that's not coincidental. Rather, they were selected. I selected, you selected, my loved one selected to infer this doubt because I'm vulnerable to this, to this self-theme. And so doubt, the verb, the verb, people, Mike was very clear, the verb, the act of doubting, the active process of doubting versus the feeling of doubt. Doubt, the verb, is pretty key here. 
And so the theme or the content of the obsessional doubting isn't the issue here. Content is a means to an end. It's helpful insofar as it helps us understand how this obsessional doubt, this narrative, was created. And so the work lies not in changing our narrative or narratives, but in understanding how the OCD sufferer reasoned themselves into that narrative versus using all the data that they can get from the here and now. It's in understanding that these data points weren't tangible data points that I garnered from my five senses or anything actually happening in the actual moment. Rather, it was built on the altar of the imaginal possibilities that I was vulnerable to. And the faulty inference of obsessional doubt is what led me to these conclusions. And as Mike said a few times over, the absorbing nature of this data, this narrative, that led you to this decision to doubt versus trusting your five senses, trusting the here and now reality before us. It's the inferential confusion that's the problem. It's not that you felt distress. It's not even anxiety. It's not even avoidance. I mean, it's a whole lot to wrap your mind around, right, family? And there's a good chance that I am still muddying it up. <laughs> But here's the good news. Good news. Good news, family. Mike will be back with us next week to help break this down a bit more because today it was really helpful and it was really interesting and it was really radical and it was really different. And I get, I buy in, I, I get that decreasing inferential confusion as a mechanism within OCD can reduce its clinical significance. Like that's been proven. But how then? How? 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 How do we reduce, decrease this inferential confusion? I want to know. But this is a big meal, y'all. And uh, I need this first course to digest a bit more before I'm going to have any room for seconds. So because this segment is all about application, here's what I want to invite you to do and chew on this week along with me. Do you have questions? Write them down. Maybe next week, maybe, maybe next week's show will answer them. But if not, send them my way. Because we're better together, family. And I'll do what I can to help us all understand this better. Also, today, Mike talked with us about this concept of crossover points. So whether you're the fierce supporter of your loved one, the OCD sufferer yourself, or the clinician treating these amazing warriors, at what point in the story, what point in these narratives, does the person stop trusting their senses in their here, their now, and cross over into the imaginal possibilities of the what-ifs? Whether this all makes sense to us or not, whether we're ready to give it a try or totally staying over here on Team ERP, which, psst, if you didn't catch earlier, we're like the same team, same team as against OCD. But if you want to stay with ERP, that's fine. I still challenge you to identify some of these crossover points. From my standpoint, there's no risk of taking this little step, this little lean forward, just to, just to see how we could apply it. Just give it a try and then come back next week because Mike is going to talk with us about what treatment looks like. Because, okay, we've figured out or are going to work on figuring out some of these crossover points. So uh, what now? I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm really intrigued to find out the answer to that one. So join us because if you ask me, it sounds like more hope is on the way. And I am here for it. Thank you for joining me and our OCD family community. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please like and subscribe to the OCD family podcast wherever you enjoy your podcasts. Did you find this content helpful? Please consider leaving a review. The more people that know they're not alone, the better. For more information regarding today's podcast, please visit ocdfamilypodcast.com and remember to join the email list while you're there. It will provide you with the most up-to-date information, resources, and the download on the family chatter. Oh yeah, nothing says family like inferences of doubt that are hanging about. 
That's right. I went there. And you can too at OCDFamilyPodcast.com. <laughs>